So I'd like to <clears throat> start and give you a little background on the previous Green Economies Dialogue and some of what we learned for it that's relevant. Um, but our new focus will be to translate what we had done and move forward with a focus on the Sustainable Development Goals and the post-2015 development agenda. Let me start by indicating who participated. Along the top, we have a series of institutions, the Business and Industry Advisory Committee to the OECD, the USCIB and its foundation, who provided a strong uh, basis and, and very good connections and, and support in what we did. CNI, the Brazilian <coughs> Association, Kadan Rin in Japan, and Resources for the Future in Washington helped us organize and host meetings uh, at their locations in Brasilia, in Tokyo, and in Washington. We also had a number of companies, some of whom I might call the usual suspects, big energy companies, but we also had companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers, Procter & Gamble, Novozymes, and others who were not necessarily the usual suspects. They were connected to a whole array of issues that are relevant. And also we had a few associations who also participated with us. As Kerry said, we, we began early in the process before governments had formed their positions and tried to create an interaction with national governments who participate in the international process. We organized day-long dialogues with about 50 people. And I remember a couple of groups, uh, both in Japan and in Brasilia, saying, this is the first time we've had a discussion about green economy and Rio Plus 20 and focused on business issues all day. I mean, we focused on the concepts, but we kept bringing up business aspects. They said they found that very useful in terms of the questions. I remember in Brazil, we were told, these are political and economic issues as well as moral and environmental issues that we need to have. <coughs> and that was, in fact, what we were trying to promote. Um, I'm going to give you a few of the learnings and observations that came from the process. Aside from the dialogues, we also felt it was important to commission, to invite a series of academic perspectives papers that were published in the peer review literature. They're all available on our website. We had about 20 authors from major institutions, MIT, Oxford, Stanford, a whole set of uh, institutions. And they also enriched our dialogue. One conclusion is that greening and sustainable development, and basically we interpret green economy, the business community, in the context of sustainable development. So this isn't a big gap for us. This is just a logical extension of the way we think about these issues. They are processes, not outcomes. 20 years ago, we would not be having the same discussion we are now about what the issues are. Five or 10 years from now, we may not either. The issues that we find to be most important may evolve with time, we need to be flexible, and think about how we address them, not just what the outcomes are, because things may change in ways that change our thinking. It's pretty clear that to be effective, policies must align with national priorities and circumstances. Otherwise, they'll simply be agreed to, but they won't have much impact on the outcome. But as Pete indicated, our members and most of the associations we deal with are, in fact, multinational companies who deal with international aspects. And we're very well aware that these outcomes, these approaches, have to function in globalized international markets uh, in order for investment, trade, and so on to occur effectively. We don't see green economy as a green economy. There's a, an economy which needs to become greener. Goods and services are produced and consumed, uh, economic Surpluses in the form of finance are incredibly fungible from football teams to airline plants to you name it. It's the economy that matters. And to succeed, we need economic growth. Many of the proposals <coughs> that have been put forward for greening are not necessarily going to generate growth. They may be highly desirable. They may require public support. But that support won't be forthcoming unless we have economic growth and the resources in the public sector as well as the private sector to deal with issues going forward. Jim Sweeney in Japan, Jim's a, an economist at Stanford, <coughs> point that to develop economic growth, you need activities that produce economic surpluses, and then you need to reinvest those surpluses to continue to create economic surpluses. That's a very strong 
set of conditions which are often not realized. Sometimes even in the investments we make, they just don't work out the way we hoped they would. Business will be the primary source of innovation and global deployment of advanced technology. But as has already been pointed out, it's not just technology per se. I think sometimes business overemphasizes technology per se. It will require innovation in business models, in finance, and a whole variety of areas, including know-how and management systems, where again, business will be the essential developer and deployer of these new goods, services, and so on. And progress simply has to involve the entire economy. It needs to involve all countries and sectors and across supply and value chains. Within a sector, I don't know if this is a surprise, sometimes it is to people, we're not all on the same team. We're in the same league. We compete with each other very, very strongly. But the other folks are our suppliers and customers, and we get along really well with them. Sometimes we get along with our competitors too in joint ventures. But these things have to work across the whole system in order to ultimately be effective. And policies to mobilize sustained business effort require sound enabling frameworks to promote fundamentally new solutions that are going to require new systems are going to require investment and innovation. And both of these need necessary enabling frameworks. And that will be most of what we're talking about today. And finally, we believe there's an opportunity and a need, and it's already been stressed in both the talks, uh, for enhanced business engagement. We are delighted with our interactions through USCIB with the State Department, who helped us not only in our meetings here, but also in other countries, and with our interactions with the OECD and others. So we think that's a strong theme going forward as well. So what are we looking at? I think the main factors that we want to think about are frameworks that promote innovation. I, I worked with ExxonMobil for 32 years, and for the first 20 years, I worked in the research labs. I am the proud inventor on four patents, none of which were commercialized. <laughs> but the research wings of companies have to pay for their capabilities, too. Society sees the successes. You don't see the failures. If we knew which were going to be successful and which were going to be failures, we wouldn't do the failures, but we never do in advance. So a huge number of projects never result in commercialization, even when they're technically successful. But the winners have to pay for all of them. Without innovation in the private sector, we will not have the new products, processes, and services we need. IPR has become a big issue in the negotiations. Business sees it as an enabler, not a barrier, and we could talk about that at length during the Q&A session, but there's no question that IPR is a key driver for private sector investment in innovation. Again, just drawing from the energy sector, but you could pick others, the rate of investment that IEA and energy information and others forecast, merely for supply and distribution of energy, is easily a trillion dollars a year. If you want to respond to climate change too, it's probably another trillion. Partly in different investments, partly in more of some of the ones we had to make. There is a tremendous amount of trade already embodied in the movement of equipment, goods, and services simply to create the project investments. And then they generate products and services that also rely on trade and the ability to invest. It's critical, we know it can be an enabler, and we have given Winchester here with us who's going to talk a little bit about trade and investment. It could also backfire because there are other sides to the coin like whose jobs and where are they that sometimes get in the way of trade. So it's a, it's a tough issue. It's a very big political issue and we certainly hope it works out as an enabler going forward. And finally, certainly for private companies, but for most companies, we have to produce returns to shareholders. We are investing shareholders' money. We have a fiducial responsibility to do that wisely. It requires a return. I know in the climate debate there's a lot of discussion about mobilizing $100 billion a year of new and additional finance. I think this should, debate ought to be in part about mobilizing $15 billion a year of returns on investment. If that could be demonstrated, the finance would flow automatically. It's not the amount of money, it's whether it will generate a return. Key to those types of returns are the rule of law, honoring of contracts, independent, effective judicial systems. 
and then a whole set of other issues that are just fundamental to conduct in modern society. But it's rule of law at the end of the day that goes into people's assessments of risk management for risky long-term investments with a payback that might be 15 or 20 years and hoping that things will work out. We can't trust the markets, they'll change. Our competitors may do things we didn't like. But we hope there will be a rule of law in which we can conduct our business and resolve differences going forward. So those are some of the key things that came out of the Green Economies Dialogue Phase 1. In Phase 2, we really want to engage on the development of the Sustainable Development Goals, their implementation, not probably so much at what the target or objective is. That's, at the end of the day, a deep political issue. We'll certainly engage on that, but certainly on the ways forward, the enabling frameworks. And I know one of our speakers is going to address a dashboard concept in which metrics and information are critical, and business, I think, has a, has a deep and abiding interest in those questions, too. So those are my remarks on our first phase. And going forward, uh, we hope to engage uh, in this process. Again, I, I think our focus will primarily be national governments, but also the OECD and UNEP with whom we interacted uh, along the way in this process.